Hello and welcome to today's virtual panel in which we will be discussing how train station design is an important element for improving users' experience. On behalf of Global Railway Review and Green Furniture Concept, I'd like to thank you all for attending. I'm your moderator, Craig Waters, editor of Global Railway Review. I'm really pleased to be joined by three excellent speakers for this panel today. I'm joined by Johan Bain, founder and designer at Green Furniture Concept. We have Angus Campbell, senior partner and deputy head of studio at Foster and Partners. And we also have Matt Stacey, head of stations at East Midlands Railway. So this is a really great opportunity for you, the audience, to engage with our speakers. So please submit your questions for them. And you can do that at any point during the discussion using the questions panel, which you will find in the menu on the right side of your screens. So perhaps we could start off with a very brief introduction from each of our panelists, please, um, to give um, our audience some information about your backgrounds um, and your current roles and responsibilities. So perhaps if we could start off um, with Johan first, please. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Craig. Nice to um, be here with you all and Angus and Matthew. Uh, it's going to be a, a nice discussion. Um, I'm Johan Barron. I founded Green Furniture uh, a little bit more than 10 years ago. I'm a designer and I founded it around a series of benches that I designed for Stockholm Central Station. Uh, and like that, it's really nice also to have Angus on as you're working with the next uh, new and modern central station of Stockholm. Um, I thought I'd show you briefly a few images of what we do as it's something very visual. So you have that before your eyes when we talk later. So uh, uh, if I can have that screen shared, Chloe, thank you. Great. Uh, and like this. So this is the kind of environments that we do uh, at Green Furniture. Uh, the set of benches that came from Stockholm Central Station design at, that, with, that we have now spread over the world, and also the trees uh, in the background. So all of this being placemaking furniture, some furniture that does something to the place, uh, that evokes feelings and create memorability. And, and that's, yeah, that's what we're here to talk about today. So it's nice to, to show you like that, what that could be. And this is what you're usually then encountered with in railway stations uh, around the world. Um, something very efficient, something very functional, um, but not really placemaking, not really nice, not creating an, an environment where you want to be. And you can see that looking at the people here that they're really phasing out uh, and, and really avoiding that cold and hard thing. Um, and this is the same place, it's London Bridge Station. Uh, the night after, uh, with the only change of changing that seating to something architectural that plays with the room um, and that uses natural and, and biophilic materials. So that's the only thing that was changed and that's how also the satisfaction of the place changed from 30 to 80% overnight. Um, just a few more images like that uh, of var varieties on the same theme. Um, and also we're going to talk about inclusion. So I'll just show you this now so we can we can have that afterwards. Inclusion being together, uh, sitting together with your family, uh, inclusion as, as having place for families and kids, inclusion as showing also by colors that people are included, uh, wheelchairs in line as well, sit together again. So, so very important, I think, and very powerful really to address all the visitors of a station uh, and not only the elderly not only uh, the the ones that have difficult to move or see but really all of them so let's talk more about that when we come there and here an example image that we just installed at london waterloo showing that in real with the pride colors and last an, an image from stockholm central station where am i Furniture design story started, uh, and and like that, I'll leave over to to Angus, and uh, you're gonna show a little video about yeah, the, yeah, the. Yeah, no. Thank you, thank you, Johan. Sorry, and I'm a man in transit, but I'm about. I have arrived to my destination, so I thought it was quite good. My name's Angus Campbell. I'm a senior partner at Foster and Partners, and really, I've spent 30 years of my life designing rail infrastructure projects around the world. 
And I've seen the transition between just pure pieces of infrastructure to now destinations, transport hubs, and real city centers. And what I wanted to do is I transfer from <laughs> one vehicle to my house, is show you a little film which Johan has touched on, is it's a recent, the latest station we've just designed. It's right in the center of Stockholm. And there's a little movie which will show you, which will explain the design and the design approach, which I'll talk about in more detail later. So with that, I will turn off my camera. And Craig, if you could play the film, it has a little voiceover that tells the story and see you shortly. Thank you. We are delighted to have been selected as the winning team to develop Stockholm Central Station. Originally opened in 1871, Stockholm Central Station had a detrimental effect on the urban fabric, later compounded by the introduction of the car in the 1960s. The new master plan gives us a great opportunity to reinstate the Central Station's position in the city and develop Sweden's central hub for sustainable travel. We will bring together all modes of transport in a single transportation hub by making the following big moves. Realign the new central tunnel below ground with Klarbergersgatan to create an east-west link across the site. A possible future addition to the tunnel could provide a further connection through to the city barn. The tunnel will then connect to the midpoint between the extended platforms to create a single intermodal station. For future flexibility of track layout, we have chosen an advanced construction technique to bridge across the tracks. On the western side, a new centralised logistics centre will service goods and refuge directly from the tracks without affecting the public realm above. We will remove half of Klarbergersgatan viaduct by redirecting private cars but keeping the bus route. This creates the space which allows us to extend the northern end of the historic waiting hall by combining the new and historic parts of the station. The new deck level reaches Vattagatan and the new connections to Central Plan and Kumtholmen, establishing a southern entrance to the railway. We will build on the existing streetscapes of the city, following the historic street pattern and the scales of the Clara blocks, resulting in a dynamic mixed-use district with activated public realm, better connectivity and clear wayfinding. We will recreate the historic railway park on the southern tip with spectacular views over the old town of Gamnestan, Sodomalm and City Hall. With respect to the historic skyline of Stockholm, we have minimised the impact of the massing by adapting the urban blocks to fully integrate it into their surroundings. Like a traditional Stockholm block, the building massing becomes slightly taller towards the wider streets. Chamfered corners create small public spaces. By creating cross streets and a flexible Stockholm block structure, we allow the sun to penetrate into otherwise shaded areas. The new transportation hub will spread across four different levels, underground tunnels to provide increased connectivity, a platform level with extended access and increased capacity, upper deck level with a new vibrant public realm, a new mixed use development above. We have used the most advanced digital assessment of the climate to inform the building's optimal massing. The new Stockholm Central Station will be built using a circular economy, constructing the new buildings from upcycled and repurposed materials, minimising its carbon footprint. Together we can realise our dream, creating the world's first climate restorative transport interchange providing sustainable travel for all of Sweden. Welcome to Central Station. Excellent. Well, great video there. Um, so we've heard from um, Johan and Angus. Um, so last but not least, Matt, can we have a little introduction um, from you, please? 
Hello, yes, uh, nice to nice to see you all. Uh, so I'm Matt Stacey. I'm uh, I'm head of stations uh, at East Midlands Railway here in the UK. Um, so I'm the I'm, I'm the operator. I think I um, I'm I run or I'm in charge of running 104 stations uh, across uh, the East Midlands uh, region of the UK. Um, so we run services uh, between key regional hubs. Uh, here in the East Midlands down towards London. So the intercity service from London uh, up towards Leicester, Derby, Nottingham, uh, Sheffield, uh, and uh, rural services between all the regional services between all of them uh, and, and into, uh, into rural Lincolnshire. So East Midlands Railway uh, is part of the uh, Abellio group of uh, train operating companies here in the UK. Um, so ultimately we are uh, we're owned by uh, Dutch State Railways um, NS, uh, who, who have the uh, franchise to, to operate the railway um, here. Uh, I look after uh, about 450 um, employees uh, who work on our stations across the network, um, and uh, as I say, responsible for all, all sort of facets of station operation. Uh, I'm also in charge of the maintenance of our stations. Um, uh, so all of the stations we lease from Network Rail, who, who, are, who are our ultimate landlord, um, but we are in charge of day-to-day -day maintenance um, activities there, so I lead a small team of, uh, of maintainers uh, there. I'm, I'm a transit professional kind of through and through. Um, start, started my career uh, actually with our parent company, uh, Abellio. Uh, have worked on the buses, uh, have worked at various train companies um, throughout, uh, throughout the UK. Before I was here, I was a uh, station manager at London Euston uh, for, uh, for one of our sister companies. Um, and I think probably most importantly, I'm, I'm, I very much see myself as a transit user as well as a transit professional. Uh, I don't own a car. Uh, I use our service every day, uh, travel travel across the UK and, and Europe on uh, on the rail network. So both a um, uh, both an operator, a maintainer, and uh, and a user as well. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Matt. Um, sure we can get some um, good insight from you um, as we uh, go into a bit more of a discussion. So um, those are our three speakers. Thanks all for joining. Um, so as we know, train stations all over the world are, of course, you know, they come in all shapes and sizes. Some are housed in historic buildings. Others are being renovated as parts of um, areas undergoing substantial regeneration. Some are even being newly constructed um, as part of infrastructure projects for new rail lines. So. As the rail industry goes through a revolution um, and making it easier um, than ever before for people to gain access to railway networks, um, train stations must, of course, also be transformed to cater not only for the rail passenger, but also for the communities who, who live close to them as well. So I wanted to um, kickstart the discussion um, with um, a first question and some um, thoughts from the panelists, please. Um, about um, what station or what do station users want from their experience and how have users demands and expectations changed over recent years um, perhaps we could hear from um, Matt first as obviously you're from the train operating company I'm keen to know um, what do you know about station user expectations and what do they want from their time um, within stations how have things changed Obviously, in uh, in the last couple of years, there's there's been this little thing going on in the background called uh, called COVID that that we've seen has has had a huge impact on on the way that uh, customers see stations and and use our services. So we map our priorities of uh, of customers, so um, you know, rank their priorities uh, in terms of what's important to them. Um, and what we've seen across the service, both on the trains and and in the stations, is is almost the complete reversal of uh, of, of customer priorities. So historically, before COVID, um, essentially um, the vast majority of customers told us they they saw our stations sort of very functionally. Their number one priority, um, unsurprisingly, was punctuality of train service. Um, so the station was almost just there to facilitate that. In many cases, that ties into the fact we have a lot of commuters um, travelling with us, uh, who, whose goal was pretty much, I think, it's fair to say, to spend as little time as they as they could. Uh, on the station, pass through seamless experience and straight off to their destination. Um, we saw that completely flip on its head. So, so cleanliness clearly, um, uh, both of, of trains and particularly of stations, 
um, uh, went through the roof. So, so for the first time, we think ever uh, on our net, on our network, uh, our, our customers' priorities became cleanliness of the of the station and perception of cleanliness. Um, the two I do think are are, are linked, but 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 quite distinct. Um, and we've gone through a program recently where we we've, we've tried to. Uh, our stations have always been clean, um, but they didn't always look it. Um, so we've been trying to to, to tweak that um, sort of experience for users to you know simply by, for example, painting um, uh, brighter whites on stations uh, for you know, canopies and, and platforms. Um, so um, we we saw we saw that absolutely come through in COVID. Interestingly, it's it's um, settled back down a little bit now. We're actually back to punctuality now being um, the number one number one priority, which probably won't come as a great surprise to most people. Um, but nevertheless, cleanliness has stayed really high up uh, uh, our customers' agendas. Um, so it now sits at number three. So number one is punctuality. Number two is the ability uh, to find a seat. So again, linked to COVID, linked to that feeling of space, certainly some of the messaging that was coming out um, uh, globally around, you know, avoid public transit, um, uh, that can, you, can you walk from the side of other ways you can go? Um, and, and then, yeah, num number three is, um, uh, is, is sort of this, this cleanliness that's, that's, that's just rocketed up. Um, what we've seen is that's, um, that's linked hand in hand and in many cases has accelerated some of the changes that we, we were expecting to see. Obviously, we all know what's happened to uh, commuting, which has, um, which has not come back in the way that, that some of the rest of the demand has come back. Um, but also that acceleration towards digital. So people are interacting with our, with our stations and our services in, in a far more digital way and they're far more comfortable interacting in a digital way than they were, uh, than they were before COVID. So we've seen barcode tickets uh, on phones completely take off. Um, so we've, we've sort of yeah, seen massive, massive increase in the number of people using, using electronic tickets on phones. Um, and that's kind of led to us, our, our, our business strategy, which, which we're applying uh, throughout sort of the end user's experience, but again, especially in our stations, which is that um, we, we are shifting towards digital first. So, so the phrase we use is digital first, but not digital only. We know that digital doesn't work for everyone, um, but actually what we're seeing is people are becoming far more comfortable with it. Whereas a couple of years ago, the idea of having a, uh, having a ticket on your phone was probably slightly alien to some people and, and a bit nervous, what if the phone dies? What if um, you know, the gates don't read it? Um, People have got used to that um, that that new sort of digital age um, uh, in in the period of, of COVID and um, uh, yeah what 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 we've seen is that they're far more willing to embrace that. Excellent, thanks, um, Matt. Yeah, thanks. A, a good couple of points there. Um, obviously, one being COVID and, and two the digital elements. Um, Johan, I'm keen to hear from you in terms of. Um, how stations have changed and how that's impacted um, your line of work in terms of um, making sure that seating and waiting areas um, are not only comfortable, um, but what are your thoughts on um, user demands and expectations um, currently, um, but also in the future? And, and how do you think um, the station seating areas are going to change in line with, with user expectations? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm picking up on Matthew that that before stations were seen just as a place to be as short as possible, just run through. Um, and, and the moving of people has now changed also. So so there's less commuters, there's more leisure travel. The commuters also are not coming at the same hour. As before, they're more spread out over the day, as I see, and, and like that, they're also less in a hurry. I believe um, they are moving around. They they move from one from from digital meetings to real meetings. Uh, they go into the office just to to have a chat um, and and drink coffee with their colleagues, um, do a few meetings, and and like that, they're moving around. The station becomes the natural part of your day. Uh, and that station can then be useful to you. You can even sit down, like Angus just did here, on your way and have a meeting. Uh, and if there is then a, uh, an okay space to do that, if there is a good coffee, and, and if I can actually uh, have some useful recovery time or some useful working time while waiting for the train, that's perfect. And, and I think that's 
what we're seeing now. The, the image I showed from London Bridge Station, uh, Network Rail have, have spotted how people there move differently afterwards. They have slowed down. They're, they they uh, tend to, to grab a coffee, a newspaper, sit down for a little bit. They come a little bit earlier to the train. They're not just running into to the place. Uh, so and, and all this is also good for the station. It's good for the business of the station. It's good for the life in the station, especially then for the smaller stations where you want some life in there, especially off hours then. Um, to to avoid vandalism, to to make it a safe place uh, in perception. So so I think all this movement change is doing good, uh, and and like that, if we can provide a nice uh, environment in that station, it will both feel more safe and it will be more useful, and the time, the waiting time, will feel shorter as well. So all these things are really important, and this is part of a of a movement that we see now. Brilliant, thanks, Johan. And um, Angus um, from you know, an architectural point of view, um, from what Matt and, and Johan have been saying, how does all that come together in um, in the work that you do, and, and how much do you take into consideration the user experience in, in station design? Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting listening to to both uh, Matthew and and Johan talk because everything they've said, I would say, tick agree one hundred percent, but. There isn't just one answer to this, you know, in, in, because we have a kind of global reach, we, we get to kind of uh, see what, what, what is happening in Asia, America, Nordics, UK, all people are different. And I think the important thing is you need to engage with the user as you're designing it to put the customer front and center, you know, kind of, and various different bits of transit we've designed have done that more successfully than others you know with with stockholm we're just at the beginning but in sydney they created a whole customer outreach program which then created different demographics and we we actually went out and brought in different users so they could have give as we were designing it they they basically interacted with us at each stage so then really they see the stations really as an extension of the street and the city. So they're like public squares brought down into the seat, into the station itself. So then really it's all about wellness. If they're going to spend time in the station, obviously Matthew's going to sort out the trains getting there on time and it being clean, but really they want, they want the station to be part of their neighborhood. So that, you know, the stations in Sydney, they're all Sydney's, built on sandstone so we brought the sandstone into the station invest in the bits that people touch copper handrails lots of wood and furniture as kind of johan was uh, talking about lots of vegetation natural daylight all the way down to the platforms music playing on the pa when the security uh, codes are not coming through coffee shops on the ends of the platform where people don't access very often you know the concourse really feels like an extension of the city and all of our projects are like that and really depends where in the world it is how successful that community outreach is i would say but the principles are are the same i very much agree so, with you. Yeah. Um, yeah i was going to say johan the, the um um you know in terms of um concourse, concourse areas and, and the station design and when there's more retail and um, retail spaces and more amenities for for users, um, that's where we can really maximise um, uh, station usage. Make sure that um, passengers and, and the local communities are getting the most out of station um, station environments. Um, do you think you would agree? Yeah. T um, sorry. Um, yes. Uh I was mentioning the, the Coburg station in, in Germany, for example, where the mayor involved in, in the station to provide a face of the town. It's the first thing that people see visiting Coburg. So, so what they see should represent the town, like, like you said, Angus, creating that sense of place and also creating with Coburg putting sustainability first. They want to create a feeling of sustainability when they enter town. Um, so that's also um, it's a shop window to the town in that sense, and it's also a shop window in the, from the other end 
to the means of the best means of transport to the most sustainable means of transport the train excellent thanks johan um we've, we've got a question that's coming from the audience um that i'd like to get some um, opinions on they ask um how can the design um around a station be connected to crowd management at peak times so i guess with with um the move now that we're seeing um, passenger numbers on the rise um, following um, the pandemic. Um, how much of the, a station design, or how how can stations change to make sure that um, you know crowd management at peak times is handled properly? Um, Matt, is that something that you can um, uh, provide an answer with? Yeah, no, I think, um, and this is where we see quite a lot of these these priorities tend to go quite hand in hand so so we use um at our key hub stations uh ticket barriers as an example of something that we we would use to one provide you know the, meet the business objective of protecting revenue and making sure um customers have purchased the, the right ticket for the uh the service but but two they're really useful for for um for managing those crowds um certainly uh you know very topical in the uk at the moment is uh the elizabeth line opened uh on on tuesday um, so, so maybe some of some of the people on the webinar would have would have been on it. Um, I, uh, I I went on it on the opening day just just to say that I'd been there. Uh, and um, if you look at the design of the stations there, clearly these were designed pre-pandemic uh, for, for for really busy London uh, London commuting. Um, all of the stations are, are now designed to be double-ended, or the vast majority of them are double-ended. Um, so um, you know. You, you create those multiple opportunities for customers to access and, and exit the station. To some extent, the stations are so big there, um, they actually cross over multiple old underground stations. Um, so if you, if you take Farringdon as an example, um, it, uh, Far Farringdon's got one entrance to one end of the platform at Farringdon Underground Station, and the other, the other entrance is so far away that it's at, at Barbican Station, uh, which is the next stop along on the, uh, on, on the circle line. So I think, um, We've we've clearly been on a bit of a journey there um, uh, in terms of now designing um, designing the, you know, the, those mass transit systems for the crowds and to be able to be managed really easily. You can put one-way systems in. You know you can um, you can manage those crowds quite quite cleverly. Um, I think the question now is as we go into um, you know, post-COVID world and, and we've spoken about what that means for. Uh, Customer volumes and the demographics of customers and the reason why the reasons why they're traveling, the times they're traveling, um, those those peaks are very different. So I think it's a really relevant challenge uh, as we go forward um, because we're now not seeing that that you know Monday at 8:55 at the London terminus is the is is the peak. Now the the, the peak is is spread over weekends. It's um, you know, it, it, the, the peak almost starts about nine o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and doesn't end until about sort of nine o'clock at night on a Sunday. Um, so, so I guess the question for me is those um, those assumptions we've made and those tactics we've put in place as we've gone and designed uh, systems like like the Elizabeth Line um, are, are they still relevant uh, and are they relevant to this this new type of um, new, new type of demand? These new peaks we're seeing. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so, Angus, what, what's um, your views on um, crowd management within stations? How how is that made up of um, the work that you do with with station design with yeah, crowd management? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think as I was saying kind of earlier, we I mean, we put the customer thought first. So ultimately, when you're designing a station, you look at the train arrival. You know, obviously the uh, when and the disbursement of the platforms, and ultimately the first thing we do is work out how to get the people on and off the platform through the concourse and to the entrance and then shape the station around it uh, let's say because i think as as matthew's kind of um hinting at to us the a barrier where you physically have to bunch people and crowd them we try and design it out you know ultimately that's a failure on design and we've now passed that problem over to matthew as an operator as opposed to the positioning of v vertical transport so that you pull the people off the platform and you have a different type of flow to the people coming onto the platform that works with the station um, 
the train timetable and, and ultimately kind of you know I, I funnily enough I designed two types of buildings kind of one which is railway stations but also football stadiums as well and in a way they're very similar you put the passenger the, or the spectator first crowds of people coming in and out but very peak orientated um, and you've got the major crowds and then you have the kind of minor crowds and, and how you manage that. And then the building's kind of almost secondary. The building is shaped. If you do it successfully, you don't put a column in the flow of people. And, um, you know, we've designed some pretty busy stations. You know, Canary Wharf, there's Jubilee lines, 20,000 passengers an hour, peak time. And, and equally, I've done Haramein High Speed Rail in uh, Saudi Arabia. It's like an airport. It's, it can cope with 20, 000, 20 million passengers, 120 million passengers a year when they're doing the Hajj. You know, these are, and people flows mass is really important. But you do, we assimilate it. We have a lot of very intelligent software where you can put the agent profile of the passengers within it. And then you can similarly, and, and then you can test lots of different scenarios to give you the optimal configuration for that particular setting. Brilliant. Um, I'm uh, keen to also get um, a viewpoint on um, how stations must be better integrated with other modes of transport um, to make sure that you know passengers have that seamless flow, uh, make sure that cities move as, as best as they can. Um, and also it leads into a question from the audience about what impact will um, mobility as a service have on station um, design as well. So um, you know that that whole um, uh, aspect of making sure that um, everything is 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 joined up, that people are able to plan, book, and, and and pay for multiple types of mobility, and how all that comes together in in the station usability. Um, Matt, what are you what are your viewpoints on making sure that stations are integrated with other modes? Yes. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I think if, if we're entirely honest, it, it's something that generally in the UK we're, we're, we're having to learn from other people on. I, I'd suggest that it's probably one of the areas that um, that the industry flags behind, uh, lags behind others uh, on. But where, where where I've seen it done really really well actually is um, uh, in our parent company in Holland. Um, so so Dutch Railways designed their stations um, very clearly from the outset with connectivity in mind um, so uh, the, the the obvious one that, that comes to me is uh, Utrecht uh, Central Station um, where uh, the station probably over the last 10 years or so has been been rebuilt um, and it is sort of hyper connected into its surroundings in, in a really clever way so you know we, we see in the UK where um, if you take London St Pancras as our, our key London terminal we have we have the St St Pancras Eastman's railway platforms. We have the Eurostar, which is almost at the opposite end of the station. Um, we've got the Underground, which is a, a, a separate station again, and it can take you five minutes to, 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 to walk between them. Um, and we see that on a slightly smaller scale than some of our regional hubs. So Sheffield has a tram stop, but the tram stop isn't integrated into the station. Nottingham has a tram stop. Tram stop's above the station, but it's still a bit of a walk round um, to, to get to it. Um, whereas if you compare that to Holland, um, so, so Utrecht has got a bus station, a tram station, uh, and, and cycle parking, uh, all integrated into the footprint um, of the station. So, so if you um, if you if you walk across the way the station is designed, is you've got sort of your island platforms and above it as the key uh, uh, sort of um, concourse area and, and, and walking space, um, and you go down an escalator to your to your platforms and and that's the case for there's probably 10 12 platforms there um and, and then there's another island at the end uh which is which is where your buses are um and they 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 drive in almost as though they were they were a train so it's as easy to change between trains as it is to change between modes the the, the, the tram line is at the other end of the station and then you've got a, certainly when it was opened it was europe's biggest bicycle parking garage uh un, under the station as well and and when you when you look at motivations for that um for me this is you know there's obviously commercial um benefits there for the rail company to to, to be to be expanding you know the, the um the reach of the station so so you know you've um 
you, you've obviously got you know car parks which, which help expand expand the area of the station but but you can you can integrate into the city far far better you open your service up to to, to a lot more um a, a lot more customers um add in the sustainability aspect and as as um you know cities cities need to become more sustainable we have environmental targets we need to hit um that that's a really sort of socially and environmentally um sustainable way of, of opening up the rail network uh, and, and the public transport network um to more customers which i think we've, we've all got to agree is a good thing yeah absolutely and that also brings me on to um another question about um train stations and their design um and how they're evolving um into the future to be more sustainable um so which is such a key topic um obviously um you know all this around how rail contributes to being more climate friendly um and green um so how can stations play um a part in this um johan um you know sustainable furniture plays a really key part in the station's green strategy um what has your experience been in, in helping stations be more environmentally friendly yes i, th I think Biophilic design would be the key word to showing sustainability uh, and this can be done throughout the architecture really using real plants, uh, using natural materials, natural ships uh, throughout the building and as I said before it's the shop window of, of the means of transport and you can show sustainability that way. So, so uh, I think that's a really powerful um, tool to use and, and one thing that has uh, made that not to happen before uh, is there hasn't been an efficient way uh, and an, a, a durable way of using those natural materials. So having wood, for example, in the in the efficient thinking of of this, uh, people would or the station manager would be afraid of the wood being damaged. So there has to be a, a system. It has to it has to be maintainable for it to be to be able to use that's pretty much i think why why we have succeeded in this finding uh, a combination of of treatment and wood that is maintainable uh, using wax natural wax which is super sustainable really and preserves the feeling of wood uh, and that is also maintainable like shoe polish so so you can remove scratches and things like that need to to happen and, and you need to to uh, to dare taking those moves if you want greenery if you want real plants in a station um, there's a natural resistance to that now because oh people will hide bad stuff in those planters and, and in the soil and and there will be all kinds of trading uh, going on there um, so instead of just banning plants why not fixing that creating a plant where you can't put your finger down um, so, so um, I, th I think solutions like that need to be found and, and we need greenery in a station that should communicate um, sustainability and, and also in a station where you should be at ease and, and feel, create well-being. Um, so, Absolutely. Yeah. Good, and um, Matt, um, what do you, do, do you agree with those points from, from Johan? Um, and how are your stations, uh, how are your stations being more sustainable? Yeah, I, I do, and I, I think I think there's a big there's a big piece. We we've seen sort of uh, again as an industry probably in the last ten years or so, the way many of the contracts have been set up for for, for rail companies has incentivised um, quote unquote maintainable um, uh, infrastructure being put in, galvanised lamp posts and and um, you know, fences and all that kind of stuff that that actually makes the stations feel very clinical um uh, you know bright lighting um uh, and and probably doesn't add to to you know well-being um it, it, they don't feel like welcoming places um my view is you know having having managed stations for some time and ha having worked with the frontline colleagues um that that does drive behavior i think if you uh, to, to to be slightly flippant if you um if you go through a station and it looks like a prison, um, you're probably not going to behave terribly well. Um, whereas if you go through a if you go through a station and it's clearly well maintained, but also it's welcoming, it's it's soft, it's um, 
uh, you know, it, it, it makes you feel good as you walk through it, um, which, which, you know, a, a bright white and, and um, uh, you know, galvanized everything uh, station doesn't, um, that actually cuts out some of the behavior that, that we're trying to, that we're trying to avoid with it. Um, so I think, I think there is that very emotional response there. Um, in terms of what, what, what we're doing, um, we have seen, um, so one of our sister companies, uh, Greater Anglia, have installed um, sustainable wooden shelters on some of their stations. Um, we, we've been looking at that and, and are sort of currently trying to work out how we, can, how we can take that idea and tweak it. Interestingly, we've been on a bit of a journey with the maintainability um uh peace so so um the uh the asset our senior assets and facilities manager who uh, who works in my team uh was very very against it um he's uh he, he's a, he's a galvanized enthusiast he's uh, you know that that for him is is the way that you keep that maintainability um and actually what he's been really surprised at is when you're using natural materials there's quite natural ways to 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 maintain them so um, uh, our sister company gave us examples where, um, so, so we would be, we have a, a service quality regime that means that if we, if we have etching, for example, um, on, on one of our waiting shelters, uh, if it's not fixed in a short space of time, we, we get fined. Um, now, if that's on GAL, that's a, that's, a, that's a bit of a nightmare to get off, but actually if it's on wood, you can sand it down and put a new, put a new coating on. It's actually far, it's far easier to maintain. So that's the kind of journey we've been on. Um, and now it's simply a case of, of obviously, when in, in you know, the world where time, uh, t money's a little bit tight, um, finding uh, finding the cash to make those investments. Um, but but we've really been on that journey and uh, and are very supportive of um, of that sort of sustainable infrastructure. Uh, a question to the, to your math there on on that topic. Uh, so uh, if if um, there was a service providing that that feeling and, and that well wooden wooden parts with the maintenance in it would that be easier to I, I suppose now you're sort of struggling to find the maintenance scheme and what kind of materials should you use but if there was a service that would guarantee you this uh, so you wouldn't get fined or even take that into the service um, I, I, I think that's kind of that's where the where the world is heading uh, in a circular economy uh, <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're, you're keen you to. Oh, well, no, I'm keen to because I, I, I kind of think, Johan, you and Matthew, you're kind of tickling. You're not grabbing the problem, you're tickling it. Mm -hmm. Because, in a way, the Paris Agreement, the world's focus on sustainability and what we need to achieve to reverse climate warming let's say kind of the temperature warming sets a very high bar or low kind of in terms of what we have to do to get there none of the building regulations none of the certification is anywhere near that yet so what you have to look at with you know the built environment plays a huge part and you have to look at both the operational energy and carbon as well as the embodied carbon of what the building profits all together. And, and what, we, what we end up kind of doing is, you've got to look at this whole picture and the Nordics, kind of Stockholm, Sweden, is ahead of the game. I kind of look at it that the children, there's a reason why Greta Thunberg is Swedish. She knows more than our politicians in terms of about this subject, you know. And what we had to do for our sub submission was actually we had to give them a carbon footprint for our entire design that included the demolition, the build, the phase building of the project and operational of the whole project for, for 50 years as part of the submission. And the, I hear a lot of my colleagues in different parts of the world saying there is no carbon database for the world. No, no, there is in Sweden. They've got it, it's public. And if the piece of, material you're trying to use is not certified already you have to certify it otherwise you can't use it and what so what that did was because we had to submit a solution that included this we had to look focus in on the market in sweden what was available and because it was including demolition as well you know we realized that sweden is closing its cement factories 
because it pollutes the ground pollution, pollutes the surrounding areas. You can't actually get cement in Sweden anymore. You have to import it. And it's not a very climate friendly product. So in the end, but they're, they're very good on green energy, green steel. Traffic Verket, who's the equivalent of Network Rail in Sweden, has a lot of rail tracks, which they don't know what to do with, recycle them into green steel. So we moved away from a concrete structure. We went with a green uh, steel structure. And, and the facade is made up out of different, because they're building tracks all over the place and they're demolish, demolishing existing buildings, but they hand demolish those buildings, keep the building stocks. So we've got the bricks. We've got the stone and we'll rebuild the new buildings using the materials that they took away. And I'm just talking about the embodied carbon. Then in terms of the operational carbon, we looked at all of it. So we looked at how, how could we naturally vent ventilate? Could we use the uh, cool water cooling from the, the, the kind of lake that freezes um, during the summer? Could we have ice stores? We used that entire thinking in there. And, and that's what I think is that obviously you've got to do what you can with an existing product to improve it but when you're designing it you have to look at the whole the whole cycle so happy the to hear parts that of the world are doing it no. um great to hear uh, as being swedish makes me proud <laughs> well uh, and, and and johan as, as as we kind of there's a remarkable amount of carbon in the internal fit out and furniture so you, as, as, as you see, I think your, your products will become infinitely more popular because you've solved the maintainability, the long life uh, things, the fire risk component of it. And its carbon footprint is fantastic, which is a major part of the considerations here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's actually cl climate positive. In the end. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and speaking of, of the circularity, uh, also we have started to bring back uh, old furniture from Swedish railways, from other Swedish stations, uh, where the demands have changed, the buildings have changed, uh, and we use those old parts in the new, uh, and like that, creating a circular system. So all the new benching will have a little bit of old parts, and and we offer them also to take back uh, and buy back because that's a resource out there for us. So so they have the benches out there have a value to us. If they're not used anymore, we want to use them again. Uh, and like that, creating a circular system uh, and, and moving them around uh, where they're most needed. No, absolutely, absolutely. I need to go and open the door. I'd be really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, we've got a, uh, we've had a lot of questions in from the audience, uh, and I'm conscious that um, of the time. Um, but um, I, I will kind of want to move the conversation on to some other elements, which I think are really important um, to discuss. So um, how about um, we take a look at um, accessibility um, as a key point um, in, in station design? Um, you know, stations need to be accessible for all users. Um, so what works well now? Um, but, you know, how can accessibility be improved um, in the future? Um, Matt, how have your stations improved access for, for people? Is it, you know, down to step free access or wayfinding solutions? Um, what projects or initiatives um, have East Midlands Railway been, been working on to make sure stations are accessible for all? So, so we've got a huge range of, of projects going on at the moment. Um, clearly, clearly, it's a really big, it's a really big priority um, for us. Um, so we, in some cases, we're, we're, we're starting from, from quite a low base. Uh, you know, these are Victorian stations that uh, require a lot of modernising. Um, one of the things that's very big in the industry in the UK at the moment, is, as simple as it comes, is, is tactile paving on platforms. Um, we, we've um, uh, that there was a, um, an accident um, some years ago um, on uh, another operator's line south of south of London, um, where uh, Unfortunately, um, a disabled customer ended up dying because there was no tactile paving on, on the edge of the platform. So we're, we're really um, pushing very hard on just to get those absolute bare basics right, um, installing um, tactile paving uh, on platform edges. So we've, um, 
we've got about 40 stations uh, out of our 104 at the moment that aren't accessible. So that's a really clear priority for us working with NetRail to, um, to, try, to try and get that um, in, into a much better place. The other thing we're focused on massively is, is the journey experience. Um, so, so while if you take Nottingham, one of our, one of our hub stations as an example, um, Nottingham is fully accessible. Um, and the, so, you know, some people may say, all right, well, we, we, we tick the box, we're fully accessible, jobs are good and move on to the next one. Um, what we've seen is although on paper it is fully accessible, um, the service in the round um, really isn't. Uh, and um, uh, and that's been putting um, those those customers that have those accessibility needs off using our service. So we've we've we've, we've focused a lot of effort, um, uh, particularly in the hub stations. One, improving the accessibility service, but two, actually giving over space to these people, um, making sure that they feel welcome in our station. Um, so we've uh, probably 18 months ago installed an accessibility lounge um, in Nottingham Station. Um, a designated area because um, where, where people go to be, if they need assistance getting on the train, um, they, they can sit there, they can wait for it, they know that there's one of our uh, employees who's keeping an eye out for them, hasn't forgotten about them, is, is, is going to make sure they get on the train okay. Um, one of the big problems we have in, in the UK uh, across most of the network is, again, because it's Victorian and because the uh, tracks are shared between freight trains and passenger trains and different types of passenger trains, um, there's always a gap. Um, the industry is starting uh, to, um, to, to, to improve in that area. Um, so Greater Anglia, one of our sister companies, has just bought uh, a fleet of low floor trains that um, are, are very close to being entirely step free uh, to, to, to board. Obviously, the Elizabeth line is step free in the central section, but it isn't outside on the Victorian network. Um, Mersey Rail, another one of our sister companies, has, uh, has is also just in the process of introducing a, a fully low floor fleet of trains. Um, for me, that's surely got to be the next bit where we, we've got to when when we're designing uh, either. And again, I think it's another example of probably where a, a design failure or admittedly a failure to anticipate 180 years ago um, it has now led to a problem today that we're having to fix through. Uh, fixed through the um, the new rolling stock that's coming in, um, but that's a huge barrier to people. And that that um, you know we're, we're at the stage where still a very large proportion of customers across the industry um, need somebody to come physically put a ramp down for them to board the train, and that causes huge anxiety. Um, you know, what if I don't get met? What if they forget about me? It, it also is it, it is kind of robbing those people of of that independence. Um, and uh, yeah, so for me, there is this spectrum of one, we've got to absolutely get the basics right, like having tactile paving, like having the right waiting spaces uh, for customers. But we've, we've got to be designing in um, uh, that ability to self-serve people who want to, uh, regardless of, of a disability um, or, or, or not. Absolutely. Thanks, Matt. And uh, Johan, um, accessible seating and providing seating for, for all different station users um, has got to be really high on um, on the agenda when, um, you know, from a design point of view, um, right? It is really, it is really. And, and here we also see that usually our customers and the, the stations uh, themselves, this is quite, quite new, doing something more than just having the room for the special room, as you say, Matthew. For, for the, it's also needed because that's where they're picked up. That's where they can feel safe. But also spreading this kind of seating around, labeled and not labeled. Not everybody wants to be labeled, right? But but they need double off. They need a higher seat. Um, and, and also spreading different kinds of seating around the building. So so there should be a corner for for all. Um, and like you said, Angus, also if you have the opportunity of designing the station to be to to make it attractive all along to make the ends attractive so you pull people out there um and like you said on the coffee shops on the tracks um in the ends of the tracks um so, so really to to use the station overall and have a variety um that's also a part of you know like the biophilic design doing like nature nature is never monochrome nature is never the same straight there should be a variety um and people will like that, and that should be a, a yeah a softness in the flow 
on that as well. I, I never commented on the efficiency, but the, really the, the softness creating where you have straight hooks, that is not a, not a natural flow. Uh, so, so building on that um, uh, and the variety for, for also for accessibility. And, and also, yeah, I, yeah, leaving for you now, Agus, I, I hear that, that so very different lines when you have the opportunity of building a new station and being able to think of all this, it's magnificent. And, and the, the struggle that Matthew has having the, the great Victorian stations, but they have to be modernized, they have to, to get the flow in there. So, so you need, Matthew, you need boxed solutions that you can bring, on, bring in overnight to fix all this. And I guess you can design it from the start. So that's two very different standpoints, but they some at some place come together. Oh, I, I mean, I, I, I think it's it, it's a very interesting discussion because obviously Matthew brings real problems on an existing service that was designed before these issues were properly considered. Now, obviously, um, when you're designing it from first principles is actually relatively simple because you look at the flow of people all together as you say and you and you and you don't want an impaired person to feel as though they're a second class route and bring them front of center and almost design them first and then make sure that they're not um somehow um uh, it's a parallel uh, route through through the stations but repairing existing infrastructure is a tricky is a tricky thing to do because i think as and stockholm was a classic example as that because in a way the city is not good for kind of uh, mobility uh, around the city it's got lots of steps and hills and 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 things and therefore this ability to almost put yourself in the eye of the 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 different types of user and kind of in effect use the building and see where the problems are and then work with the architecture to somehow solve it. That's how we do. We, we basically kind of put ourselves in through, see ourselves through the eyes of the customer. And then what would the customer want? Well, they'd want the lift or right in the middle of the space. Okay, well, that's not quite great. But if we move the gate line off to one side, so it pulls the crowds away, one end actually could be where the elevator is because it moves the natural flows um, away away from each other but the customer engagement to actually also we do it simulated first and then the importance of actually getting people in to test it in its digital form before you've gone to the effort of building it i think is 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 crucial you know we should use the new tools we have to help us uh, shape a better future let's say we don't have to build test it and then leave it to Matthew to sort out when it doesn't work, you know. Because I think you we're spending an awful lot of money on infrastructure. It plays a crucial part of making cities work. And if the if they can't use the railway, they'll come in their private car or taxi, or and then it'll block the roads. And public transport has to function better. Um, and a lot of our work is actually taking infrastructure that has been invested in already but it's not used to full capacity so how could we bring more capacity to the station to actually you know densify bring urban development closer to the station to actually bring the users closer there's no point building a big car park around the station that makes no sense so could the railway industry learn um, more from from other industries so perhaps like the airport sector and, and how they operate their stations and what they do inside their stations and and, um, uh, and um, you know how can um, we learn from other sectors and improve our stations from from seeing what other people are doing um, is is that an option is that a question to me anybody well, no, I, I, I tell you one thing as we kind of conclude this. The big change we've seen is is we want to bring cities closer into stations. We don't want stations in car parks or stations in green fields. And what that does is we see, I haven't done a project within the last 10 years that's not integrated in its thinking. And the old fashioned model where the the kind of the 
the government or the local authority would pay for a station and then whoever was lucky enough to own the land around the station earned all the money off the value capture of that land around the station. That's very old fashioned now. Now you actually get the private developer is willing to help invest in getting a very better, a better quality station, a better quality integration and passage between the two. But he's got his own criteria that he wants to place on the station. And in many ways, as Matthew was saying, Crossrail has just opened. But one station, in my mind, is different. Canary Wharf Crossrail Station is different from the rest because Canary Wharf paid a significant amount of money for that station. Uh, 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 not Transport for London. Why did they do that? Well, because they had a special need. They didn't want the station to sterilize building property. So they wanted the station to be in the water. When you put a station in the water, you're taking away a public asset. So we put a park in the development. But actually what you have, you've got a very a station that's below the water's edge. There's then five levels of retail built on top of the station. And the station box is the foundations of the station, of the, of the building above. It was all built as one project. So actually, it's actually the, the whole place is called Crossrail Place. And the retail and the park and the activities on the top, it's been open for five years. And they've had the benefit and, and, and the station actually adds to the bridge and opens up development on the other side where they're building a hospital. But in many ways, it's part of a, a, a kind of integrated thinking and you don't have to make the station operational before it can improve the public realm around it is where I was coming from. And I think that's the future. And, and it's just different parts of the world will get there quicker. Absolutely. And, and building on what we had the past where the station was the center of the town and the meeting place where things happened. Uh, this is where we're going back. Absolutely. I think, I think you bang on. Stations were originally almost the first building to be built there with the town hall on a square mm -hmm. facing each other. And things have moved away, but I think, you know, it will come back and mixed use developments where people can live, work, play, educate as hubs around transport is what we should be aiming for. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much, um, everyone. I'm really sorry, but unfortunately, that, that's all the time that we have. Um, we could have gone on for a lot longer, um, but unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, great to hear all of your um, views and all of your opinions. Um, such a, a key element of, of round network design is stations, and um, it's uh, it's clear to see that stations are becoming destinations in their own right. And it's really important to understand how um, these places and areas can can um, improve um, for the better. So the insight from each of you um, into your work, really interesting. And um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, Craig. Thank you. Thank you very much. And just a very quick message to the audience. As you exit the platform, a survey will appear on your screen asking you to rate today's panel discussion. Please take a moment to provide your feedback, but if now is not a good time, um, the survey will also be sent to you via email very soon. So please complete it when you can. So on behalf of Global Railway Review and Green Furniture Concept, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Um, and we hope to welcome you to other webinars and panel discussions in the future. So thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you.